Okay, so uh, last time you see we were looking at the uh, the modular function lambda, okay, and uh, you know that this modular function is uh, is only invariant under the congruence mod two subgroup. It's not invariant under the action of a general element of the unimodular group PSL two Z. So we ask the question: What will happen uh, if we apply a you know general element of PSL two Z? Uh, then we found that. Uh, this modular function lambda satisfied uh, certain nice functional equations which we derived okay so uh, uh, just to put our discussion in proper perspective see we are trying to uh, get hold of a modular function which is uh, which is which is modular for the whole group the whole unimodular group psl2c okay what we have at present is the function lambda which is uh, uh, which is invariant only for the congruence mod 2 subgroup all right so the aim is we, are, we have to use this lambda to cook up uh, another function which will be invariant under the action of the full unimodular group so that leads us to study uh, the mapping properties of lambda okay so uh, so so let me recall among uh, various uh, recurrence relations uh, satisfied by lambda uh, uh, we have the following uh, so so in particular you see we have uh, so you see we have lambda uh, from uh, the upper half plane uh, uh, with values in c okay this so this lambda uh, is uh, 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 invariant under uh, the action the action of uh, of an element an element of uh, of any element of psl2 z subscript 2 this is the congruence mod 2 subgroup okay uh, the in, a, in other words uh, you see uh, if uh, well a is an element of this congruence mod 2 subgroup then uh, uh, you know if I take a tau in the upper half plane and apply a of tau uh, of course it is going to give me another uh, point in the upper half plane because uh, after all uh, psl these are these are sub these are all elements in psl2 r which are automorphisms of the upper half plane and then if i apply lambda to this i will simply get back lambda evaluated at tau okay so this is the invariance property okay so uh, we have seen this and see in fact we saw so you know uh, uh, see we would like to know uh, that if you uh, if you look at the uh, well the complex plane uh, which I will call as the tau plane and then I take the mapping omega equal to lambda of tau okay. So this is a mapping. Uh, uh, that is going to be uh, that is going to go into uh, take values in another complex plane uh, which I will call the omega plane and uh, well uh, we are looking at uh, 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 of course uh, you see uh, for the moment uh, uh, lambda is defined on the upper half plane all right so 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 lambda is defined here this is this is upper half plane okay so lambda is defined in this shaded region right so it is defined here and uh, so lambda is defined here 
and you know of course lambda is analytic uh, lambda never takes the values uh, 0 or 1 okay and we want to know what is the uh, what kind of a mapping lambda is of course you see lambda is a it is an analytic uh, function so it will have good mapping properties okay but the question is uh, what are those mapping properties we need to we need to understand that. So the first thing I want to tell you is that you see uh, lambda so the first observation is that lambda has period 2 so this is the first observation see that is that is lambda of tau plus 2 is lambda of tau for all tau in the upper half plane okay the first property is that lambda has period 2 now how does one see this well you see uh, there are two ways of seeing this one thing is uh, you see the transformation tau going to tau plus 2 okay this has matrix has representative has, has matrix representative uh, uh, well the matrix representative will be you know for a general linear transformation a tau plus tau going to a tau plus b by c tau plus d uh, the matrix uh, representation is a b c d the matrix a b c d uh, and of course you always normalize to make sure that this is a the disc that the determinant of that matrix is 1 so that it is it is unimodular um, uh, so that it is uh, unimodular and uh, well this is going to be that way it is going to be 1 2 uh, 0 1 this is the matrix representative and you see you can see that this uh, this matrix if I read it mod 2 it is identity matrix see which is uh, which is uh, which is uh, congru which is equal to the which is i2 mod 2 okay so this matrix mod 2 is identity therefore you see uh, this is in the this is in the congruence mod 2 subgroup okay after all the congruence mod 2 subgroup consists of all those uh, elements which when you read mod 2 give you identity okay that is you have to read every coefficient mod 2 all right this is in the this this clearly this matrix is, matrix is in the congruence mod 2 subgroup and you know that uh, the uh, the the function lambda is invariant under such an element so you see uh, so lambda of uh, uh, if I apply 1 2 0 1 to tau this is the same as lambda of tau okay. So of course applying 1 to 0 1 to tau means uh, uh, it means that uh, you are applying uh, the Mobius transformation z going to 1 z plus 2 by 0 z plus 1 to tau okay. So which means you are so you are just so the left side is just the left side is just lambda of uh, tau plus 2 okay. So lambda of tau plus 2 is lambda of tau. So uh, uh, so the the moral of this story is that uh, you, you if you want since lambda has period 2 all right so it's enough to study to study you need you don't have to study uh, lambda on the whole the effect of lambda on the whole upper half plane it's enough to study it on a, a vertical strip of uh, of length 2 okay so therefore what we do is that we actually uh, so we do the following we restrict our uh, it is enough to restrict our attention to this strip. So I will take this strip so I will take this strip namely uh, uh, you see I will take this as 1 this is minus 1 okay. So I will this I, I it is enough to study lambda only in this region the effect of lambda on this region that will do. it is enough to study the effect of lambda on this cross shaded region okay. You can restrict to uh, a vertical strip of uh, horizontal length 2 alright. So it is enough to study lambda only here alright. Now well uh, of course there is there is also another way of 
there is another way of looking at it uh, you can also use uh, you can also use the fact uh, uh, we may also use so maybe I maybe I will draw a line here we may also use the functional equation uh, the functional equation lambda of tau plus 1 is I guess 1 minus lambda of tau see we proved this last time lambda of tau plus 1 is uh, 1 uh, 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 oh no I think it was uh, uh, it is it is lambda tau by lambda tau minus 1 sorry so that was lambda of minus 1 by tau okay so this is lambda tau by uh, what was that it was lambda tau minus 1 and uh, uh, now you know you apply this twice all right then you will get so lambda tau plus 2 will be lambda tau plus 1 by lambda tau plus 1 minus 1 okay and then you apply this to this you will get lambda tau by uh, you know lambda tau minus 1 divided by lambda tau by lambda tau minus 1 minus 1 and you will see that this is again going to give you lambda of tau okay so there are two there are two ways of seeing this right of course this is a, this is very straightforward right uh, all right so the uh, the situation is now that i it's enough to study lamb the effect of uh, lambda on this uh, on this region okay then the uh, so what is it that uh, 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 what is the kind of result we are going to get so the so let me uh, state what the state the result that we we will get it is the following so let me write the theorem <coughs> theorem okay so this uh, you see uh, let me let me draw this circle here which is centered at half and radius half okay so i get this i get this region okay and similarly i can draw a circle centered at minus half again with radius half so i'll get something like this okay and uh, let me look at this region okay let me look at this region uh, okay let me look at this region that is bounded by the imaginary axis by this uh, circle and by this line which is uh, a real part of real part of tau equal to 1 so this so you see this is this is real part of tau equal to 0 this line is real part of tau is equal to 1 and of course this line is uh, well real part of tau equal to minus 1 okay so you look at you look at this uh, you look at this region that I have shaded uh, I have not shaded it fully but the boundary is supposed to be uhhh consisting of this portion of the uh, imaginary axis followed by this uh, semicircular arc and then this portion of the uh, line passing through 1 or vertical line passing through 1. Let me call this region let me give a name to this region let us call this region as omega let me call this region as omega all right uh, then the theorem is the following the theorem is uh, lambda maps omega injectively uh, in fact let me say lam lambda maps omega isomorphically on to the upper half plane okay so it is very beautiful so this 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 region 
you see this region here this region omega uh, the the by omega I mean only the the interior of the region do not uh, include the the boundary curve the bounding curves okay. So, the that that interior is of course an open set okay and the fact is that this open set is completely mapped isomorphically by lambda onto the upper half plane okay. So, the so the so so this the so the image of that is this whole upper half plane and the and the, the fact is that you see it is uh, the the fact is that it is an isomorphic it is isomorphic that means it is injective and holomorphic of course lambda is of course holomorphic right. So, uh, to prove this you just have to prove that uh, uh, the map lambda restricted to this open set is uh, 1 to 1 and that it takes every uh, value in the upper half plane if you do that then you you will get you will get this the proof of the statement. Not only that of course you know you expect a, a conformal map when it maps a certain region to a certain region then it has to map the boundary to the boundary all right. So, uh, the beautiful thing is that this uh, of course you know lambda is defined only for the upper half plane okay but the fact is that you can extend lambda to the boundary of uh, of this uh, region omega in such a way that you can expect where the boundary has to go you see the boundary has to go to the boundary here the boundary is the real axis okay. So, the fact is that lambda can be continuously ex extended to the boundary so that the boundary of omega goes to the real axis okay. So, let me write that down further lambda can be con continuously extended to the boundary of omega okay which which means uh, you know this portion of the imaginary axis followed by this semicircular arc and then this portion of the of this line okay. So, that so that uh, which which is mapped which is mapped by which is mapped on to the real axis okay which is what you should expect because uh, uh, the boundary of this region has to go to the boundary of that region okay. So, you see uh, uh, so this whole thing is going to map get mapped to the uh, uh, to the real axis and the uh, and uh, which values are going to be mapped to which. So, uh, you see lambda the value of lambda at the point at infinity okay will turn out to be 0 okay. So, so in such a way in such a way that zero uh, so the point at infinity goes to zero okay so on this on this complex plane there is a point at infinity okay you which you must think of as you must actually think of this stereographic projection and think of the point at infinity as the north pole okay that point goes to actually zero okay then the point zero goes to one okay 0 goes to 1 okay this 1 will go to infinity this 1 here will go to the point at infinity okay. So, you see what is happening as you come from the point at infinity on the on the Riemann sphere to 0 to 1 and again go back to the point at infinity on the Riemann sphere what happens is the lambda values go from 0 to 1 to infinity and then back to 0 that is how lambda be that is how lambda is extended to the to the boundary 
okay so this is the uh, so this is the theorem okay so uh, I mean the importance of this theorem is that uh, because of uh, uh, the behavior of this region under se under several of those mappings which were the mappings that you got uh, in the congruence mod 2 subgroup okay when you read it in z mod 2 okay you this allows us to extend I mean to cook up from lambda a function which is modular uh, on the for the whole unimodular group okay. So the, the key lies uh, in this in studying this region okay the key lies in studying this region and uh, this region is kind of fundamental for the way lambda behaves uh, the way lambda maps okay so um, so we will have to prove this so th so this is roughly the uh, uh, roughly the aim and in fact I should uh, I should also say that you know I could have also taken I could have also taken the the mirror image of this region okay I can take the mirror image of this re region about the uh, the imaginary axis and you know I will get this region here okay I will get this region I will get this region all right now let us call this region as uh, something let us call it as let us say uh, omega prime okay the fact is that this omega prime will be mapped by lambda to the lower half plane okay this omega prime will be mapped by lambda onto the lower half prime and again the uh, the mapping will extend to the boundary with the same properties okay and mind you the values of lambda here are exactly the same as the values of the lamb of lambda here because this differs by 2 which is a period of lambda all right so what will happen is that you see the image of this is going to be is going to be this the lower half plane you are going to get this okay so let me write that lambda also maps omega prime isomorphically onto the lower half plane uh, which is which I will call as minus u okay so this is uh, this is well this is u so this is the upper half plane this is minus u this is the lower half plane okay uh, so this is how lambda behaves this is how lambda behaves and uh, and of course uh, the so so the effect of uh, the mapping on these two pieces uh, will give you the full image and of course you will have to extend the mapping to the boundary to this boundary and of course if you have extended it here it all automatically extends here okay so you have to only extend it here right so uh, well so this is so this is this is what we have to prove okay this is what we need we need to prove and as a first step towards that you see uh, um, so uh, I am I am going to try to prove this. So the first thing I am going to try to show is that, uh, uh, that the value of lambda uh, on this uh, uh, on this boundary okay I am going to show that the value of lambda on this boundary is actually real because after all you see you see what lambda is doing what lambda is doing is that you see it is it's, it's mapping this whole thing onto the real line okay now uh, so for that we let me again draw this uh, draw the diagram here okay and make a make a certain observation uh, so here is so this is 0 this is 1 this is the tau plane okay um, so you have so you have uh, so you have the semicircle here 
So you see this is real part of tau equal to 1 this is uh, this is real part of tau equal to 0 and of course you know uh, this this semicircle is uh, you know mod tau minus half is equal to half this is the uh, this is the equation of a circle centered at half and radius half right. Now uh, what you must understand is that or what we can observe immediately is that you see uh, this uh, this imaginary axis I mean this uh, this imaginary axis is mapped by tau plus 1 onto this okay. So you see if I if I apply tau going to tau plus 1 this every point here goes to a corresponding point here all right and the point in the upper half plane goes to a point in the upper half plane 0 will go to 1 all right and notice that we know that lambda of tau plus 1 is as I as I wrote it down here uh, lambda of tau plus 1 is lambda tau by lambda 2 minus 1. Okay. So you know what is the advantage of this functional re relation it is if I prove lambda, lambda is real on this okay if, la if, if for tau on this if I prove lambda of tau is real then this will tell me that lambda is also real on this okay. So that is the advantage of this functional equation so, so lambda real on uh, the imaginary axis uh, implies lambda real on uh, real part of tau is equal to 1 okay and of course uh, uh, of course I should uh, I will have to worry about the point 0 and the point 1 because for the moment lambda is only defined on the upper half plane okay. So uh, what I am saying here uh, applies only to uh, uh, only when imaginary part of tau is uh, greater than 0 okay. So, so let me write that down uh, where imaginary part of tau is greater than 0 okay. So you will have to leave out this point and you will have to leave out this point right. Then notice also that you see this this imagine this line is mapped on to this circle by the transformation okay, so there is a transformation that is going like this and this transformation is none other than tau going to 1 minus 1 by tau you see take the transformation tau going to 1 minus 1 by tau it is a it is a Mobius transformation it is certainly a Mobius transformation and you see and you know uh, that a Mobius transformation will map straight lines to straight lines or circles and circles to straight lines of circles you know that that is a fundamental property of uh, Mobius transformations. So you see it, if you take this tau going to 1 minus 1 by tau you see if I put uh, tau if I put tau equal to infinity so infinity will go to 1 okay tau minus tau uh, going to 1 minus 1 by tau if you calculate this infinity goes to uh, 1 the point at infinity goes to 1 all right and then well infinity goes to 1 then if I take the point 1 which if I take the point 1 1 goes to 0 okay uh, I mean I should uh, maybe I should put uh, mm, no that is all right I mean uh, I am only worried about this transformation I am not applying lambda okay so if I put tau equal to 1 okay uh, 1 goes to 0 all right and then uh, well if I put something uh, something in between um, say for example suppose I put, put tau, tau is equal to uh, 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 suppose I put tau equal to 1 plus i okay which is which is this point here uh, which is which is this point here 1 plus i is somewhere here this length being 1 okay then 1 plus i will go to what it will go to 1 minus 1 by 1 plus i which if you calculate is uh, uh, it is 1 plus i minus 1 so it is i by 1 plus i 
and that turns out to be i into 1 minus i by 2 and this is uh, i plus 1 by 2 okay this is so it is 1 plus i by 2 which is this point it is half plus i by 2. So you see this this Mobius transformation maps infinity 1 plus i by 2 1 to 1 uh, 1 plus uh, infinity 1 plus i 1 in that order to 1 1 plus i by 2 0. So you know uh, so this is the conformality as you go from as you move from infinity to 1 okay uh, the image of this uh, line is, ma is traces this semicircle in this order okay. So you see this is mapped onto this now you have another functional equation this the second functional equation that we saw was that lambda of minus 1 by tau plus 1 okay this this turned out to be well if you recall that it is uh, uh, it is lambda tau minus 1 by lambda tau we have this we, we proved also this functional equation. Now what does this tell you this tells you that if you knew that la lambda is real on this you can then conclude that lambda is real on this okay. So, so lambda real on real part of tau equal to 1 implies lambda real on uh, on this segment uh, uh, on this on this semicircle for imaginary part of tau positive okay. So you see to show that uh, lambda is actually uh, real on this boundary I have to only show that lambda is real on this imaginary axis okay and I have to worry about the point 0 I have to worry about the point 1 that is all I will have to do okay. So, so you see uh, so we so what so the first part uh, uh, of our discussion uh, uh, proceeds to uh, show that lambda is is real on the imaginary axis okay so lambda is real on the imaginary axis so um so let me write that down we only need to uh yeah to check lambda uh defined is defined and real uh, uh, on the boundary of omega del omega okay we only need to show number 1 lambda is real on the imaginary axis. this we need to show this okay uh, uh, in u of course okay and number 2 uh, lambda uh, at uh, 0 uh, and so like you have to show lambda of 0 is uh, uh, 1 lambda of uh, 1 is infinity and and you know I, I need to also show limit as uh, tau tends to 0 lambda of tau uh, tau inside omega is uh, 1 limit tau tends to 1 tau inside omega lambda of uh, uh, tau is infinity okay. So this is what I have to show see if I uh, 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 if I if I show this 
So, if I show this then I will know for sure that uh, you see that this this boundary is mapped onto the real axis and that it and that the, the only true troublesome points are these two points and there that is the, the those are the points where I will have to check continuity okay. So, that I make sure that the uh, the mapping when you extend it to the boundary is also continuous. So, I will have to verify these two limits as well I have to check, check that the limits uh, are these values and then I will have to verify these limits okay. So, this is going to be the first part of our discussion right. So, how does one go about this? So, uh, to begin with um, now I need to uh, go down to uh, go back and define uh, a more general Weierstrass free function okay. So, uh, so let me do that let us recall that you see uh, uh, we need uh, to uh, define a more general uh, ISS phi function we need to do this. So, what do I mean by that? So, what you do is well you fix uh, two complex numbers omega 1 omega 2 two complex numbers with uh, the ratio uh, with omega 1 of course both not 0 both not 0 and uh, uh, and omega let us say omega 2 by omega 1 is non real okay that is omega 1 and omega 2 are uh, uh, linearly independent as elements over r the real numbers okay. Then associated with this we will have a lattice okay. So, you get L of omega 1 comma omega 2 this is the lattice uh, spanned over z by omega 1 and omega 2 and what is this? This is just the z span namely it is all z linear combinations of omega 1 and omega 2. So, it is of the form n omega 1 plus m omega 2 uh, where n and m are integers okay and uh, of course, uh, the lattice that we have been so far considering was L of 1 comma tau where tau was in the upper half plane, but instead of taking 1 and tau we are simply taking two complex numbers such that the ratio omega 2 by omega 1 is not real all right. Now, you if you uh, if you recall you take uh, you take the complex plane and then you go modulo this lattice okay namely you declare two complex numbers to be equivalent if they differ by an element of this lattice. In other words you are thinking of the lattice as the group of Mobius transformations that act by translation by elements of the lattice okay and then you are going modulo that group what is the result the result is again a complex holomorphic torus it is a it is a Riemann surface okay. So, what you get so this what you get here is the torus uh, T sub well T sub omega 1 comma omega 2 uh, it is is a complex torus complex torus uh and uh, and of course you know you will you will see that uh, the way we got the Riemann surface structure on this torus uh, was such that uh, this this mapping pi is a holomorphic map and in fact this this mapping is a holomorphic universal covering for uh, this torus and the fundamental group of this torus can be identified with the lattice above. Uh, as the deck transformation group of this covering and the deck transformations are precisely elements of the lattice being thought of as translations on which are automorphisms of C okay. So, this is so, so this is the picture and again see uh, our aim 
is to uh, get hold of a, uh, a simple function on this the simplest possible uh, uh, analytic function on this of course you will again not get an analytic function on this because uh, this is compact any analytic function on this will be constant. So you will see that you will have the one the simplest function you can think of this will be a meromorphic function okay with uh, which which will show up as a meromorphic function above which is invariant under the uh, lattice under the translations by the lattice it will have a double pole uh, just like the phi function uh, that we saw for the case when this was 1 and that was tau it will have again a double pole at each point of the lattice okay with residue 0 okay and again uh, what happens is that you will get you will get f f s as phi function let me call this as phi sub omega 1 comma omega 2 and this will take values in c union infinity this is the Riemann sphere this will be the Riemann sphere and of course it will go down to give you uh, uh, you, you will get a function here which is the simplest meromorphic function you can think of on a complex torus okay. Now uh, and how do you define uh, this piece of omega 1 comma omega 2 it is the formula is literally the same form same as the formula that we that we uh, used to define the phi function when uh, omega 1 was 1 and omega 2 was tau. So the formula is pretty uh, pretty the same pretty much the same uh, so you see uh, phi uh, phi sub uh, phi sub omega 1 comma omega 2 of z turns out to be 1 by z squared plus summation omega varying over this lattice of omega 1 comma omega 2 omega not equal to 0 1 by z minus omega the whole squared minus 1 by omega squared it is the same it is literally the same uh, for of the same form as you uh, as the as the phi function we defined when omega 1 was 1 and omega, uh, omega 2 was tau okay. So uh, so uh, phi tau of z is just phi in this notation it is phi 1 comma tau z the original the, the function that we defined earlier is just phi 1 comma tau you take omega 1 as 1 and omega 2 as 2 okay. Then again uh, you can see that uh, the the, uh, the arguments uh, that we had for p tau of z uh, about its properties will all hold for this okay and in fact again just like p tau of z satisfied a uh, differential equation uh, this will also satisfy a differential equation all right. So what will happen uh, uh, is that you will get uh, this will satisfy the differential equation equation so that is the that is the same it is literally the same differential equation that we had earlier and that is going to be well uh, uh, p phi prime squared is equal to 4 phi cube uh, minus g to phi uh, minus g3 you are going to get the same uh, differential equation okay where uh, of course uh, this phi is phi sub omega 1 comma omega 2 you are going to get the same differential equation and you can continue to factorize it as 4 times uh, phi minus uh, e 1 into phi minus e 2 and to phi min and into phi minus e 3 and uh, to determine what e 1 e 2 and e 3 are uh, we look at the zeros of phi prime and you find that e 1 is actually phi of omega 1 by 2 e 2 is phi of uh, omega 2 by 2 and e 3 is phi of uh, omega 1 plus omega 2 by 2 you you get all these things all right and the uh, the arguments are exactly the same uh, as they were when uh, omega 1 was 1 and omega 2 was tau okay you can you can do try you can 
try writing that out as an exercise exercise and you will see that literally the same arguments uh, do it all right now uh, well the uh, the see the the advantage of this is that i can uh, i mean the advantage of all of this is that you know uh, i can replace omega 1 by 1 and omega 2 by minus tau where tau is in the upper half plane okay see in the original phi sub tau that we defined tau was in the upper half plane so i couldn't uh, replace tau by minus tau because if tau is in the upper half plane minus tau is in the lower half plane and i have not defined the phi function uh, when tau is in the lower half plane okay so it's only to overcome that difficulty that i am looking at this more general uh, phi function okay now uh, what i want to tell you is that uh, So I want to tell you that if you now look at these these functions, uh, uh, yes. So I what what I want to tell you is that uh, uh, I just want to say that if you now put omega one equal to one. Okay, and omega two equal to tau. But now, don't uh, assume tau to be. Uh, just assume tau to be uh, imaginary, uh, non-real. Okay, assume it to be complex, not real. So it could lie in the upper half plane, or it could lie in the lower half plane. Then these three become functions of tau, on the uh, which may lie either in the upper half plane or in the lower half plane. All right. Then I want to say that these three as functions of tau they are real on the imaginary axis okay so you see so let me write that down so you see even note that even is actually a function of omega 1 and omega 2 that is i mean each of the eis are a function of omega 1 and omega 2 okay so uh, the the even is phi so so from here onwards uh, uh, phi is actually phi sub omega 1 comma omega 2 okay see the phi depends on omega 1 and omega 2 all right so e 1 is is uh, uh, this phi of omega 1 comma omega 2 evaluated at omega 1 by 2 so what you must understand is though i write e e1 is is phi of omega 1 by 2 you should not misinterpret it to think that e1 depends only on omega 1 e1 also depends on omega 2 similarly e2 e3 so all the a's are functions of both omega 1 and omega 2 all right now uh, see the fact is uh, if uh, tau uh, uh, is uh, if tau is uh, 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 a purely imaginary okay if tau is purely imaginary that means either tau is in the upper half plane or uh, uh, and in the on the imaginary axis or it is in the lower half plane and on the imaginary axis okay then uh, the ei of tau are all uh, real or they are all real value then these EIs are all real valued okay and uh, what is the uh, what is the proof for that um, so so let me take uh, let me compute uh, uh, so you know so but before this I need to tell you uh, I need to ask you to put omega 1 equal to 1 omega 2 is equal to tau uh, uh, which is not an element of uh, which is not real okay so put omega 1 equal to 1 put omega 2 is equal to tau which is where tau is not real okay and then the fact is uh, if this tau 
the tau may see tau is not real so it could still have a real part tau is not real only tells you that it has an imaginary part which is not 0 okay it could have a real part if further that real part is 0 that means that is the case when tau is purely imaginary then I say that E i of tau are all real value. So you see uh, so when I write E i of tau now it is really a function of only tau because uh, the only variable here is tau alright. Now let us calculate let us calculate this for example uh, what is E1 of tau E1 of tau is by definition P of 1 comma tau of uh, uh, 1 by 2 this is what it is by our definition okay and you see this is uh, uh, what is this this is by our definition it is 1 by 1 by 2 the whole squared plus summation over, over omega in the lattice generated by uh, 1 and tau okay uh, omega not equal to 0 1 by uh, 1 by 2 minus omega the whole squared minus 1 by omega squared this is what it is this is what E1 of tau is. Now you see calculate uh, 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 calculate E1 of tau uh, conjugate okay calculate E1 of tau conjugate the E1 of tau conjugate if I so if I take conjugate on this on this side if you watch this is not going to be affected if I take conjugate here you see what is going to happen is that this omega is going to be replaced by its conjugate okay. So what I will get is I will simply get 1 by 1 by 2 the whole squared plus summation over omega in L 1 comma tau omega not equal to 0 I will simply get 1 by half minus omega bar the whole squared minus 1 by omega bar squared this is what I will get alright. Now you see that uh, if, if tau is purely imaginary then uh, tau bar is minus tau okay so what you will see is that you see that this will be the same as this okay which will tell you that therefore that E1 of tau is uh, real if tau is purely imaginary okay. So uh, because you see uh, what is omega bar see omega bar must will be an element of the form n plus m tau I mean omega will be an element element of the form n plus m tau therefore omega bar will be an element of the form n plus m tau bar okay. So you know this can be written as 1 by 1 by 2 the whole squared plus summation over uh, well uh, omega belonging to L uh, of 1 comma tau uh, so now you see I replace omega bar by omega if I replace omega bar by omega in this summation I will have to replace tau by tau bar alright. So I will have to put tau bar and I will have to put omega not equal to 0 and I can write the same old expression I can now write it as half minus omega the whole squared minus 1 by omega squared I can do this okay because I have replaced omega by omega bar and uh, replacing omega by omega bar is uh, to compensate for that I will have to replace tau by tau bar but you see uh, tau bar you, you see if tau is imaginary tau bar is minus tau so L of 1 comma tau bar will become L of 1 comma minus tau but the lattice of generated by 1 and minus tau is same as the lattice generated by 1 and tau. So this will be simply equal to E1 of tau if tau if 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 tau bar is equal to minus tau. So uh, so the moral of the story is that if uh, tau is imaginary then uh, uh, if tau is purely imaginary then E1 of tau is real alright. So from this it follows that lambda is real because lambda was cooked up uh, from these things okay so let me write that down so this is uh, this should be thus E1 of tau is real if tau 
is purely imaginary. Okay. Similarly, uh, E two of tau, E three of tau are real if tau is purely imaginary. Okay. So, this implies that lambda of tau which was defined to be uh, E 3 of tau minus E 2 of tau by E 1 of tau minus E 2 of tau this is how lambda of tau was defined this turns out to be real if uh, tau is pure is purely imaginary. So, this uh, completes uh, the proof of uh, this statement that lambda is ima lam lambda is real on the imaginary axis ok. Uh, so, this is the next statement that one has to prove and I will uh, I will do that I will do that in the next lecture.